Ladies and gentlemen, welcome all of you to, to this building, which is the headquarter of the Marine Research Institute, um, the Icelandic Marine Research Institute. Uh, although the activities of the Marine Research Institute are not directly related to the main theme of, of your con conference today, that is safety, transport, and tourism in, in the Arctic uh, area, our organization, the Marine Research Institute, is actively involved in, in research projects that are related to the marine environment and the living resources in the Arctic and adjacent seas. We have claimed that the seas surrounding Iceland are a large-scale laboratory for studying ocean climate changes and their impact on the natural resources in the sea. And this is very much so due to the fact that Iceland lies on the border of cold and warm sea currents and the temperature gradient from South Iceland to North Icelandic waters um, is very steep or in the range of 10 to 15 degrees centigrade from the far northwestern area where it can be minus one or less even uh, down to the Iceland ferro ridge where the temperature uh, in summer may be in the range of 10 to 15 degrees. So this in itself al allows us to study and understand the influence of temperature variations on the life in the sea. However, not only the spatial uh, variability is of interest here. Nonetheless, uh, no, no less is the temporal variability we have between variations in temperature range, uh, substantial variability. For instance, in the North Icelandic waters, uh, this may be as much as four to five degrees uh, in two consecutive years, uh, which is substantial in, in oceanographic terms. And when we look at the last century or so, we can identify decadal variability with warm, cold, and intermediate uh, conditions in the ocean area around Iceland. So, surely we can claim this is uh, uh, a mega scale uh, laboratory to study temperature variability and, and, and life in the ocean. And during the last 10 to 15 years, we have been into a warm water period with dramatic implications for many important fishstocks in this area. And this has required intensive uh, studies of new fish stocks and stocks that have been regarded as, regarded as uh, domestic or home, home stocks within the home range. Uh, and this has called upon intensified investigations on how changing environmental factors are impacting the living resources. And finally, we have been facing quite serious international disputes between countries how to share and manage these resources, these uh, resources that are a changing uh, distribution and migration. And not the least, uh, uh, as you know, the valuable North Atlantic market stock has been a subject for major, uh, major controversy and, and disputes uh, between countries in the North Atlantic Ocean dependent on, on, on these fish stocks. So, I think all this reflects on what we will be facing in the polar waters in the decades to come. And if we look at the, say, past century in the North Atlantic Ocean, we can, we can very much predict the future developments with respe respect to global warming, how, uh, the, how the conditions will change and, how the, uh, and what the implications are for the living resources, and what kind of problems in handling the, these issues internationally are required in order to safeguard the stocks and the sustainability of the environment. And I believe um, we need to understand that, that there, there, there is a need, strong need for uh, intensified uh, scientific efforts to understand these dynamics uh, in the system. And we need to organize ourselves 
in such a way as to secure proper management of the resources, including traffic, safety, and tourism. So, saying this, I would like to wish you a fruitful and successful day. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Johan has to blush, actually. <laughs> Uh, my name is Gunnar Thor Johannesson. I'm the, uh, the chair of the session today. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Geography and Tourism at the University of Iceland. Uh, very welcome uh, to this symposium and let me first express my gratitude again to Johan and the Marine Research Institute for this kind invitation to use this excellent facility here today. Now, uh, this symposium was established as a part of a postgraduate course at the University of Iceland called Tourism in the Arctic. <coughs> and, um, uh, well, one of the ideas is, of course, uh, when we talk about the tourism as one of the fastest uh, growing uh, activity in the Arctic, then, of course, safety and, and rescue uh, is one of the most important issues that we have to deal with. Now, the speaker's guide here today, as well as the panelists, will shed light on the different aspects of search and rescue in the Arctic and the challenges awaiting us in the context of tourism and transport in the area. Anna Karlsdóttir and Ingeber Gjólsdóttir, uh, the main teachers of the course, have together with our students that are around here and also taking care of the coffee and so on and all, all the technical aspects of such an event as we have today, they have organized this event. Uh, apart from the Icelandic Marine Research Institute that supported us uh, <clears throat> with this facility here, I would also like to acknowledge the valuable support from the School of Engineering and Life Sciences at the University of Iceland that uh, has helped to realize this event. Now, we will now move to the speakers on the program that you have. We have six uh, speakers. Uh, actually, uh, there's a one last minute cancellation by uh, Gunnar Stefansson, <coughs> and um, <coughs> you have to uh, cancel his participation today. Uh, I'm going to be very strict on time. We already have a slight delay, uh, so I would kind of li like to ask all speakers to, well, speak not, no more than 15 minutes. And I will uh, let you know if you're running late and stop you if necessary. Uh, after the presentations, we will have a coffee break to continue discussions and so on, but I will encourage everybody to speak for 10, 12 minutes, and we have at least time for one question or one or two comments after each presentation. After coffee break, then we will conclude with a panel discussion. Now, uh, first to the podium uh, is Mr. Stuart Wheeler. Ambassador of Canada to Iceland, and his presentation is titled International Context, Canada's Chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Stuart, the floor is yours. Welcome. Um, I'm not going to need this, so I don't want to... Can everybody see all right? I'm not using that, but... <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, mesdames et messieurs, Cairo uh, Vinir, uh, good afternoon, bonjour. Sem sendi herra Kanada á Íslandi er mér mikil heiður að fá að vera með ykkur í dag á þessu áhugaverða málþingi og til að fagna tengslum mikli Kanada á nágrana þess á Norðurskáttinu. Þær áskoranir sem við stundum frammi fyrir í Norðri á næsti áratökum krefjist þess að við vinnum saman og mörgum leið í þróun á þessu svæði sem er bæði vistvæn og sælbær og gagnast því fólk, fólki sem býr í Norðri. Kannaðamenn eru stolt, stoltir að því að vinna að þessu áskoranum með Íslendingum og öðrum félagum í Norðurskautsrauðinu. And that's it for the Icelandic today. Uh, as, no, please. 
Uh, as Ambassador of Canada in Iceland, it's really um, uh, a pleasure to be here. It's an exciting time uh, to be uh, in Iceland and to be engaged on the Arctic agenda. Um, I hope my remarks today can give you a, a bit of background uh, on the international cooperation going on to identify, assess, and address some of the issues that uh, that other panelists uh, and, and will be will be talking about this afternoon, and other um, and those uh, everyone here um, uh, obviously has on uh, on the top of mind, um, uh, given your interest. It, it's often said that uh, that we can do um, that that alone we can do so little, but together we can accomplish so much. Uh, it may sound cliche, uh, but these are wise words. Uh, the world's biggest challenges have never been uh, resolved by one person or one group acting alone. Um, achieving success needs to be done cooperatively. Collective action is therefore the best way to address the many challenges and capitalize on the many opportunities in the North. Through the unique structure of the Arctic Council, the eight Arctic states and six indigenous per permanent participant organizations cooperate to govern effectively in the region, to build bonds of common cause, and to develop and release key reports and studies that shed light on the state of the Arctic and help us to understand how we can together face the challenges that the, sh the harsh northern environment presents. The decisions that are taken by the Arctic states to promote and protect the region are informed by the knowledge and expertise of indigenous people, researchers, scientists, policymakers, inside and outside of government, uh, as well as the business community from around the globe. I should pause for a moment here and say a few words uh, about some of the, those elements. The Council's Indigenous Permanent Participants, for example, ever since the Arctic Council was established in Ottawa in 1996, they've been involved in all aspects of decision making, uh, and they provide invaluable contributions to the activities and projects. Simply put, the, Ar uh, the Arctic Council couldn't be what it is today without their voice at the table, and indeed uh, their uh, presence at the table with member states makes the Arctic Council a very unique uh, international body in that it, uh, that it, uh, it gives a voice um, and a consensus uh, voice um, to groups that are outside of uh, member states and government. So it's a very interesting model just to begin with. Uh, and now, of course, it also includes a large number of observer states uh, and organizations that can make valuable scientific and technical contributions uh, to the projects of the Council's six permanent working groups. Canada is looking very much forward to working with them over the coming years. The depth and breadth of the Council's many scientific assessments uh, and reports uh, that I mentioned is impressive. Uh, they tackle issues of biodiversi biodiversity, shipping, oil and gas, climate change, uh, environmental contaminants, human health, sustainable development, all with the recognition of traditional knowledge uh, and local expertise of the people who actually live in the North. In, ad in addition to developing scientific assessments, the Council also continues to evolve into a policy shaping and policy making body. Within the last few years, Arctic states, under the auspices of the Arctic Council, have concluded two important legally binding agreements. One on search and rescue in the Arctic, signed in May 20 2011, <coughs> and, and the other on oil spill preparedness and response, signed uh, in May 2013. Interestingly for this audience here, the final negotiation of both of those treaties took place here in Reykjavik. Two international treaties in, in just over two years. That's, a, that's significant progress for an organization that's only 16 years old. As both agreements not only enhance uh, Arctic state cooperation on emergency response, but they'll all also help protect the Arctic people, communities, and environment. I want to say a couple of words about Canada's chairmanship. In, in the summer of 2012, uh, in advance of Canada taking over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council in the spring of 2013, our Prime Minister named Leona Aglukak, our health minister at the time, to be the chair of the Ar Arctic Council and Canada's minister for the Arctic, sorry, to chair the Arctic Council and be Canada's uh, official minister for the Arctic Council, which was a departure uh, from, from previous, uh, previous chairmanships. Often uh, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council is, is uh, done by a foreign minister or sometimes an environment minister. Um, the, uh, the decision, though, um, was, uh, was an important one, um, uh, as uh, she's now since taken the, the job of, as Minister of Environment, and so she wears those two hats. Uh, but she's most importantly an Inuk herself, born and raised in the Arctic, and the first Indigenous person to chair the Council. She has a clear vision uh, for Canada's chairmanship, a vision of cooperation and action. 
And this re reflects the strong message that she heard over and over uh, during her extensive consultations with Northerners Wow. <laughs> Across, I thought we were going to have to leave. <laughs> uh, wait a second, they didn't tell us at the start of the, 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 the session where the emergency exit is. Um, um, when, when Minister Aglukuk was appointed, she, the first thing she did was consult with Northerners. She went across uh, Canada's north, uh, visiting um, many of the communities, uh, meeting um, people, local people, meeting uh, businesses, meet, meeting governments, meeting uh, NGOs, people who live and work in the north. Uh, and the thing she, she, she heard more and more uh, uh, as she developed uh, Canada's thoughts for, for our agenda uh, and then took those ideas and discussed them with partners around, uh, around the circumpolar world in discussions with, uh, with, with our partners in all eight uh, capitals or all seven other capitals of the Arctic Council um, was that the Arctic Council needed to put people first. Um, that's why the theme for Canada's chairmanship is development for the people of the north. Uh, and it's also why uh, we're focusing on actions that can make a difference to the more than four million inhabitants across the circumpolar north. Actions related to three sub-themes, responsible uh, resource development, safe Arctic shipping, and sustainable circumpolar communities. I thought I would take some time uh, today uh, to talk about um, a couple of our current priorities that are relevant to, to today's discussion. Uh, one is the Circumpolar Business Forum, one is safe Arctic shipping, uh, and then finally a few words on guidelines being developed for sustainable tourism and cruise ship operations in the Arctic. Circumpolar Business Forum. During uh, our chairmanship, uh, the Council will establish uh, a Circumpolar Business Forum to advance Arctic to Arctic business interests, uh, to share best practices, uh, and to engage in deeper cooperation. Uh, a dedicated task force chaired by Canada, but co-led by Iceland, Russia, and Finland, was created immediately after the ministerial last spring um, to establish the business forum and has made significant progress already in under a year. The new forum, now to be called the Arctic Economic Council, uh, is Minister Aglukuk's flagship initiative and one that will help build stronger and more diversified commercial relationships uh, um, uh, within the region uh, and also help uh, business to seize the opportunities to create prosperity for northern communities and northern uh, inhabitants. It's also a recognition, though, that businesses active in the north, uh, and in today's con uh, context, in t including tour operators, cruise lines, um, all sorts of, uh, of, of actors who are active uh, working in the region, have valuable experience and expertise that needs to be brought into the dialogue uh, to ensure that we gain and share as much concrete knowledge as we face very real challenges. Safe shipping. Last fall, we witnessed the, the, the voyage of uh, a ship called the Nordic Orion, a Danish Panamax uh, bulk carrier, which sailed through the Canadian archipelago from Vancouver all the way across uh, and, um, the, the Arctic and then across the Atlantic to Finland with a cargo of coal, making it the first commercial, commercial transit through Canada's Northwest Passage ever. The Northern Sea Route of Russia, as many people uh, talk about in, 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 uh, in conferences such as this, has seen a significant increase in shipping uh, over the past years. And of course, cru cruise tourism in the north has grown steadily. Uh, and we see that here in Iceland um, with the, uh, the many cruise ships that come here, um, both south and north uh, in Iceland throughout the year. And we know that, that Arctic shipping will, of course, only continue to increase. And with that uh, higher level of activity comes an increased risk for shipping accidents, which given the isolated and harsh conditions of the Arctic could have a lasting and damaging impact on the marine environment as well as on northern communities. That's why uh, members of the Arctic Council believe that it's crucial that all states, Arctic and non-Arctic, cooperate to conclude a strong mandatory polar code under the auspices of the International Marine Organization, the IMO, we believe that this will provide the necessary rules framework for safe shipping in international Arctic waters. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think that there's a growing sense of urgency uh, um, um, with respect to that, um, given that shipping uh, is increasing uh, in the region already um, before essentially the, this strenuous set of rules of the road uh, have been finalized by the international community. Um, and then finally, just a couple of words on, on guidelines for sustainable tourism uh, and cruise ship operations. Uh, with the Arctic becoming more accessible, uh, opportunities for tourism are growing. Um, uh, however, increased cr 
cruise ship traffic creates environmental and public safety challenges uh, as, uh, that, are, that are unique from necessarily the ones that, that apply simply to shipping. Uh, the Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement was an important first step in helping Arctic states to better respond to emergencies in the Arctic, but it also allowed us to, 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 to take initial stock of how limited our resources are uh, in this area and, what, and, and how enormous the challenges uh, would be if we were faced with, uh, with truly um, um, uh, devastating accidents. Um, uh, in addition to the, the search and uh, rescue agreement, obviously a mandatory polar code that I mentioned would also help address some of these issues. Um, but building on this work, the Council, in collaboration with cruise ship uh, and tourism operators, is now developing a set of best practices that will try and address sustainable tourism, passenger safety, and environmental protection. This work is being led by the Arctic Council, Council's PAIM working group, headquartered in Akurere, and I'm really pleased that Sophia is here uh, with us today, um, and, uh, and perhaps she can, uh, when she's on the panel, um, uh, also um, contribute to the discussion on, uh, on those issues. Um, but just to say that the work on that is moving forward in mid-March, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, a workshop was held in Ottawa with 36 participants, including tourism operators, industry organizations, Arctic shipping experts, local and national governments, and NGOs. The workshop uh, discussions advanced the development of a framework um, for preparation of, of what's being called an Arctic Marine uh, Tourism Best Practices Document. Um, which will be considered by Arctic Council ministers um, at the spring 2015 ministerial in Canada's Arctic, which will cap off our chairmanship. During the workshop, a number of important issues were identified, and I'll just summarize. Uh, they talked, uh, they identified um, the importance of looking at variations in regional circumstances, infrastructure, uh, geography, passenger volumes, volume, climate, variations associated with uh, different vessels and classes, uh, commercial, non-commercial, uh, pleasure craft, uh, industrial, uh, and of course, the patchwork of current regulations, guidelines, and industry standards that already exist. Uh, and they started developing a range of best practices uh, for further discussion. PAME will continue that work um, uh, over the, few, uh, the next uh, months, and then a second workshop is being planned for the fall to finalize uh, the ideas. Let me just say, the, the, to conclude, the, the work inside the Council, uh, in the working groups on, on this, or, or frankly on any number of issues, is only one aspect of the mm -hmm. widening, widening attention that these important issues are getting. Uh, seminars like this are important because they bring together uh, interested academics, students, policymakers, people working in tourism, in shipping, the wider public to be part of this growing conversation. Canada is proud to be uh, the cooperative, uh, to, sorry, proud uh, of the cooperative and collaborative work that's being done with all our partners and stakeholders around the circumpolar world. Um, more, as more and more people from around the world come to visit and to explore uh, our Arctic neighborhood, we of course need to think about these important and serious challenges that, that, uh, that face tourism in the Arctic. We also need to remember the four million people who live in the Arctic and ensure that they remain at the center of the discussion about what's happening and what will happen here where they live and make their lives. Thank you. Merci. Okay. I think we just move on. And uh, <coughs> our next presenter is uh, Snorri Kraj from the Icelandic Coast Guard. And he's to going, to going to talk about SAR perspectives. Snorri. Welcome to the floor. And I'm going to find your. Continue. Continue. So while this is getting fixed, I'll just uh, begin. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for having me uh, talking here today um, about search and rescue in our region of the uh, the Arctic. Um, I'm put under 
some time pressure here, to be honest, but um, I'll do my best. If we skip the most important things, we should be good. Um, so, Ambassador, uh, dear guests, uh, um, I will. Um, okay. Uh, today, I will give you a brief overview <coughs> of the, the Icelandic Coast Guard role. Well, that is the most important thing that I'm uh, planning to skip. Actually, uh, risks and challenges in our region, SAR capabilities, and uh, the SARX Greenland Sea and Rescue Operation and uh, Rescue Operation support. Um, <coughs> You're welcome to <laughs> read this uh, uh, afterwards. Um, <clears throat> the Icelandic exclusive economic uh, zone is uh, 754,000 square kilometers, uh, and on a good day, we see more than 1,000 ships in the area. The zone is the area of jurisdiction with regard to environmental protection and natural resources, and the zone is monitored by the Coast Guard for these purposes by <coughs> aircraft, vessels, and satellites. Monitoring response can though be transboundary in cooperation with the neighboring countries. Um, the Atlantic search and rescue region is quite big and actually 18 times bigger than the land area of Iceland. Among the Icelandic Coast Guard Operation Center's tasks uh, are the joint rescue coordination center's responsibilities regarding coordination and execution of search and rescue. Looking at the map, uh, you see the Faroe Islands have taken the responsibility of search and rescue inside of their area, <coughs> uh, their fishery zone, but regardless of that, the Atlantic search and rescue region borders the search and rescue regions of Greenland, Norway, the UK, and Canada. This map shows the polar shipping routes uh, and the summer, the, the summer ice extent. Even though the, these routes uh, will not become regular shipping routes in the very near future, uh, we do see more traffic in the area. Shipping between Asia and Europe <clears throat> along the northern sea route increased from four ships in 2010 to 71 ships in 2013, and those numbers uh, talk for themselves. We also see an increase in activity due to exploration of natural resources and uh, new fishing grounds. Then we see cruise ships north of Iceland close to the edge uh, the ice edge, sorry, and in the fjords of Greenland. Also, the cruise ships coming to Iceland are getting bigger and carrying more passengers. And uh, we saw in a 10-year ten ten period uh, an increase of uh, 300%. Um, just very uh, briefly, uh, air traffic oh, uh, through the... Uh, uh, <coughs> Flight information region of Iceland uh, was 116,000 plus aircraft in 2013, and above 70 degrees north, uh, 20,000 plus. This is just an example, uh, and just shortly, this is the shortest passage, the shortest route from uh, the Murmansk to uh, Canada and the US, and uh, as you can see, it goes uh, north of Iceland. Um, and um, the vessels are often, uh, and often tankers are choosing this route, and they might be exposed to icebergs, harsh weather, and icing uh, conditions. And then the, the picture of the, the tanker that you see there uh, was taken by our maritime patrol aircraft, and um, following this route, and at the same occasion, it was called up and uh, warned uh, of um, <coughs> sea ice in the area. <coughs> Um, the Arctic is becoming more attractive following an economic development and increased activity. The, the concern arises when the increased activity is combined with the listed issues uh, like the harsh climate and limited infrastructure in the region. The concern of our ability to respond to the challenges is real and thus followed by, up, uh, by a number of initiatives, both legal like the Polar Coal Code already mentioned, and in the form of enhanced cooperation by multilateral agreement, uh, agreements, joint exercises, infrastructure improvements, and development of search and rescue plans. 
Um, this is the explorer that you see there, um, a cruise vessel that sank, expedition cruise vessel, uh, to have it more uh, specific, that sank in the Antarctic in 2007. It was designed with double hulls uh, for ice polar waters, and uh, it was uh, uh, with a DNV ice class 1A, the highest ice class uh, notification. Uh, everybody was uh, saved thanks to other nearby ships. Uh, below is uh, the Costa de Chosa that is even bigger than the Costa Concordia, and here you see the vessel at Ilo Lissat in Disco Bay uh, in West Greenland. Uh, this vessel is not ice strengthened. Uh, at the moment, we see several expedition cruises on the northeast coast of Greenland, which is uh, though the uh, this is, though, that you see here, a conventional cruise ship, uh, Dilla Chosa, that we saw before uh, on the west coast. Uh, we, 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 we though know also that the industry sees a potential for conventional cruise ships with thousands of uh, people on board also to visit the remote areas uh, on the northeast coast of Greenland. And then we should hope that uh, this is not the scenario that we will see played out in real life. Uh, this is just an example of uh, how expedition cruise vessels are sailing uh, inside of the fjords from Iceland. They can come from Svalbard as well and into the, the Greenlandic, northeast Greenlandic fjords. This sa uh, very same vessel, uh, Ocean Nova, ran aground actually at the uh, Antarctica in 2009. Another real life example is the Maxim Gorky in 89 where there are almost a thousand people on board that hit an iceberg. And um, as you can see here, uh, all the passengers ended up there on this ice floe. Uh, uh, they were uh, rescued, all of them, by Coast Guard vessel and helicopters from Svalbard. Um, now, a little bit about our assets. Uh, taking a look at the, the assets here, we have uh, our operate free OPVs so-called uh, offshore patrol vessels, one uh, coastal patrol vessel, um, one maritime patrol aircraft, and three uh, all-weather search and rescue helicopters. <clears throat> the maritime patrol aircraft is a flexible and su sustainable unit with very valuable equipment for surveillance and search and rescue in our Arctic region. The radar image from the aircraft that you see uh, shows the coasts of Greenland and Iceland, and then as well the ice edge in the Denmark Strait. Look on this map. The orange rings indicate the mission ranges of the maritime patrol aircraft. The inner ring is a mission range with a 45 minutes on scene and the aircraft returning to Iceland. As you can see, the maritime patrol aircraft covers the whole of the Icelandic search and rescue area or region. The outer ring indicates the maximum range with use of a forward post or a landing uh, for landing and refueling. So this aircraft is very important uh, to us looking solely at SAR, but uh, the aircraft serves many other purposes such as ice patrolling, emergency medical transport services and surveillance, uh, transport services and surveillance, analysis and scientist support in connection with volcanic eruptions. Uh, this uh, MPA, is deployed in foreign joint uh, operations for approximate half of the year, meaning that the aircraft is not available here in Iceland during that time. Uh, but now uh, the uh, Defense Command Denmark and the Icelandic Coast Guard, we are looking into an agreement uh, that we are hoping to realize, or uh, we'll start with the test period, probably where we will uh, look into the, the, the common uh, joint utilization of this aircraft in our area. Now looking at the offshore patrol vessels, the uh, map illustrates the vastness of the area with the wide rings indicating the mission ranges after uh, respectively one, two, and three days doing uh, 15 knots. As can be seen, the exclusive economic zone can roughly be covered within uh, one day and the search and rescue region within two days. So there you have it. Um, the Coast Guard took delivery of the multipurpose vessel 4 in 2011, which is special designed for the foreseen challenges around and north of Iceland. 
The vessel is characterized by good capabilities with regard to towing, oil recovery operations, sailing in icy waters, firefighting, and helicopter in-flight refueling, and performs as well tasks as civil protection, on-scene command and control, fisheries control, and hydrographic survey. Then the Coast Guard operates three Super Puma helicopters, uh, being a crucial capacity with regard to search and rescue and emergency evacuations in Iceland. The helicopters are quite busy, <laughs> and uh, the number of missions is increasing, which is mostly due to uh, the increasing number of tourists coming to Iceland. The crew of the helicopters is composed of two pilots, a rescue swimmer, being both a navigator, fishery inspection officer, and emergency medical technician, then with a uh, winch operator being also a flight mechanic, an emergency medical technician, and finally a doctor who also has a function as medical consultation service for seafarers. And this crew combination makes it possible to perform a wide range of tasks as law enforcement, search and rescue, local on-scene coordination, interventions for the prevention of marine pollution and emergency medical flights. Um, with respect to helicopter mission range, uh, the green ring roughly indicates the mission range of the helicopters being uh, 250 nautical miles back and forth and the 30 minutes on scene. The helicopters cover the exclusive economic zone roughly, uh, <clears throat> but not the search and rescue region, the red area there. Also, if the helicopters have to go further out than 20 nautical miles from shore, they need a backup, which very unfortunately cannot always be guaranteed. Uh, now to the Sark's Greenland Sea. Uh, the Greenland Sea search and rescue exercise, uh, exercises were scheduled on the occasion of the Arctic Council Search and Rescue Agreement, also mentioned before by the Ambassador, promoting joint search and rescue exercises with the overall objective of strengthening aeronautical and marine search and rescue cooperation and coordination in the Arctic. The SARX uh, is conducted by Denmark certainly had resonance in society and must be described as a big success for other countries to strive to equal. The receding ice that we are witnessing and the following challenges composed by increased human activity in the outskirts of our communities is of concern. An exercise like this is a tool to achieve our common objective to test and develop search and rescue plans, to explore opportunities of interaction and collaboration, and to train our air, sea, and land-based facilities in a challenging environment. This is the Yellow Island inside of King Oscar's Fjord, uh, which was actually the ex exercise location. And um, it's, it is located there inside the largest national park in the world, uh, in northeast of Greenland, which is almost 10 times bigger than Iceland. And that is what they want to see, this, uh, that we saw before. <laughs> that is what they are. All the tourists want to go in and see this. <clears throat> the scenario of a stricken cruise ship is most relevant and an issue of concern that involves all the aspects related to search and rescue inland, at sea and by air, as well as evacuation of a big number of, number of casualties, and as, then as well environmental protection. Iceland very much welcomes joint exercise of this caliber, as scenario-based studies probably is the best way to develop our joint capabilities and to train our joint efforts. This is also why Iceland participated in the exercises with several organizations and entities. The Coast Guard participated with Joint Rescue Coordination Center, Offshore Patrol, Vessel, Maritime Patrol, Aircraft and Host Nation Support in Keflavik. The National Civil Protection Department participated with the National Emergency Coordination Center and uh, the Voluntary Rescue Organization, ISAR, participated with Basis of Operation, Communication Element, Role Players and Pararescue Team, jumping from the Coast Guard MPA, and as well the Municipality Police, the Fire and Rescue Services, and the Environmental Agency participated. 
Uh, all in all, Iceland participates some 120 persons. All the organizations I mentioned here, they are present here today, so uh, there will probably be room for some questions afterwards. Um, this map illustrates the distances from the exercise area to the nearest response infrastructure. Um, uh, sorry, and you see that the, the distance is, is quite far. You see there's 800 kilometers uh, to the nearest hospital in Iceland. Two slides left. The fixed facilities in Iceland can be seen as a search and rescue resource that include many deep sea ports and three international airports. Looking specifically at the facilities in Keflavik Air Base, those include operation centers, radar and communication stations, uh, runways, fuel depot, deep sea fuel port, hangars in different sizes of warehouses to store rescue and environmental protection equipment. The Arctic is a remote area where uh, suitable facilities are few for staging of large-scale search and rescue or environmental operations. Suitable locations will have to be identified and built up in the future with respect to gathering and servicing rescue units, personal lodging, uh, capacity of medical care, triage, mass transportation of patients and survivors, and other factors as activity increases in this part of the world. Iceland is a suitable location for such a frontier as personal and equipment may be flown both from North America and from Europe in a few hours. And facilities are available for large and long-ranging operations. The exercises SARX 2012 and 13 have put this to a test and revealed the necessity of rescue operation support hubs in the remote Arctic. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I don't know if we have time for uh, for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you should take a one question or comment because I know that you have you have to leave because you have another appointment and we're so just so kind to join us today for this period. So one question before. Okay. <coughs> No questions. <laughs> I have one question. Uh, my name is Pietro Gerson. I'm the Italian consul in Reykjavik. And you happen to show uh, Italian ships in very dire situation before on your slideshow. And I wanted to ask, uh, uh, because ships with uh, four to 5,000 people aboard, can you handle, uh, can you rescue a ship like that? Uh, what are your capabilities in terms of, of number of, of passengers and crew? Uh, it's a very wide question, and it depends on the where we are talking about. Are we talking about around Iceland? Are we talking about in the vastness yeah, of around Iceland? Around Iceland, yeah. Mm, I usually say that. Um, I mean, if we have a vessel nearby, yes, it should be uh, a possible. It should be uh, possible to do that. Uh, but I also say sometimes that if if we look at the northeast. Uh, coast of Greenland and like Denmark there they have a an Arctic offshore patrol vessel there with a crew of 19 persons uh, we would see if, a, if something happens there uh, during the summer even such a ship might have at least 10 hours at least I mean we would be lucky if we had 10 hours of cruising time to that vessel to that vessel in distress um, so we have to take that into consideration. On board that ship is a crew of 19 people. It uh, corresponds to the crew on the Icelandic vessels. And um, it's, I, need, I, I, th I think it, it's not a guarantee because, uh, because if we have many thousands of passengers, it's a long operation that we are talking about. And even though there's a crew also capable of assisting 18, 19 people on board, a rescue vessel is no guarantee. We, we should just have that in, in mind. It would also uh, uh, be the, 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 the thing here around Iceland. But the first thing, and something I need to say, is that we need to have these vessels out there. We need to have this uh, aircraft there. We need to have them out on the sea. Otherwise, we don't have a chance. That is the first thing. We need to have the helicopters as well. We need to have them standby and ready. 
What you see as the option here, Snorri, uh, because as you say, these vessels may be far away, hours away, from any vessel that might be able to come to the rescue, and we're talking about thousands of people on board. That is the reality. And even as you showed us from Eloisa, vessels that aren't built for these conditions are taking people to the uh, passengers that press. In the tour operators, not to put them in, in danger. Um, do you think that a regulation to to uh, that requires vessels of this size to travel in tandem, so that the level alone, there is always another vessel within reach, so to speak. Definitely, it's a good point because if you look at the Titanic. If you look at the uh, and, and other examples, um, also in the Antarctic, it's another vessel nearby that, has, uh, that is the best uh, meaning of rescue, definitely. Whether it is uh, feasible, not the right thing, definitely having a ship nearby is the best meaning of rescue. I agree.